All right, good morning. Welcome. I'm so glad you're joining me from wherever you're watching and welcome to you here. Uh, this is Vision Expansion Weekend, where we look at God's mission for us as a community of believers. We call ourselves Family Church, but this is a small part of the greater part of who God is and what he calls us to do. And I say this kind of tongue in cheek that this isn't like a new vision. We have a vision. Jesus already gave us it to, to make disciples, to reach the nations. But this is for us today to expand the heart of God in each one of us independently as a group, and to see what God would do through us in the years to come. So it's exciting to me because this idea of building for generations really has two kind of play on words. One, we literally are going to build some things for the future generations, just like the buildings that some of you are in right now that others before us built so we could gather. They're important to our ability to reach our community. It's a big part of what we do. And so there's the physical building for generations, but there's the spiritual as well, building for generations. What's the vision of four generations of people from you being the first generation to those who you're discipling and who will disciple others beyond you? This is kind of the, the play on words of building for generations. So hang in there with me. Let's go through together a process of evaluating not only our hearts personally, but God's vision for us as a group. And so I wanted to start with this picture. Um, I want you to take a look at it. And you might notice that one of those dots is a different color. So this is a hundred dots. And you may be asking yourself, oh, this is one of those things where you're talking about that red dot is me and look at how important I am to the group. And that's true, but that's not what this graphic represents. This graphic is a representation of the global church. The entirety of the church from Douglas County to Cambodia, to Africa, to Mexico, the compilation of all the church. And the red dot represents 1%. Well, what's the 1%? The 1% is the professional, quote unquote, clergy members, staff members, hired church people that work in the church to raise up the disciples and the ministers who do the work. 1% of the entire global church is fulfilling a role similar to me as a pastor. Only 1%. So what does that say about the 99%? That's you. That's you that works in the marketplace, who has their, their time with kids they serve in the community. Maybe you're child care. Maybe you're just working at a place hard and you don't feel like you have that much impact because you have earmuffs on all day and safety goggles. But that's you. You're the church. And so when we look at this graphic, if we ask the question, what would it take for God's church to be mobilized to reach all the nations? Often, I think we get focused on the one red dot. What's the 1% doing? And we discount ourselves from the fullness of the body of Christ. We are the church. And so I want you to hold this graphic while I'm talking today and begin to see yourself as absolutely essential to the movement of God around the world and here in Douglas County. You have to begin to see yourself as essential. And I think for too long, we probably have set ourselves aside and only looked to the red dots, those who have positions or places that we see, oh, they've got some leadership authority or they've got a title. But that's not what God's desire was. In fact, the red dot's command was to raise up ministers, to equip them to do the work of ministry. And sometimes we take ourselves out of the equation thinking that our job where we live or where we work or where we play, that those aren't really places where great gospel work happens. And I want to tell you today, that's not true. It is where the gospel must continue and flourish 99% together, 100% of the body of Christ doing the work of ministry. Really important to the vision today. So I want to lay out some ideas for you and walk you through a process of evaluating your heart as we look to what God has for Family Church in the years to come as we partner here and abroad. So the first thing I want to kind of press in today is that you have a part to play, but it must start with you. You must receive grace. 
You've got to receive grace. See, for us to be effective with God in the mission of God, we have to first receive grace. And so Ephesians says it this way, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. This idea of grace, the salvation that came through Christ alone, a gift of grace of complete forgiveness, of complete forgiveness. Do you understand what this means? That, that Jesus said, look, I died for you. I took on the wrath of God for you. I took all of it for you. And it's a gift you can't even earn. I just want you to say yes to me and receive it. Receiving grace is, first starts with surrender, surrendering to the truth of who Jesus is, what he's done for us, and what it means to have life in Christ when we fully surrender to him as our Lord. Like, what a great gift. And with that comes identity. With that comes an inheritance, a promise of a future hope. All of that is true. You have to receive it through surrender, though, because you can't earn it. And so if you're in this room, if you're listening and you have received that grace, praise God. This is a big part of how we become part of God's ultimate plan to reach our neighbors and our nations. Secondly is when I receive grace, I also receive grace that says God's not content to leave me the way I am. He wants to transform me into who I've been called because of his glorious plan for my life. And so the transformational journey of learning to find hope and peace in Christ, to to be transformed, to rid ourselves as he kind of cleans us out of our sinful past because of our new creation and realigns us with his plan for us and our identity in Christ. Like what a cool opportunity. We have to receive that. We can't manufacture it. But in surrender, we can be transformed. And third, there's a relationship. So as we begin to develop this beautiful relationship with creator God through Christ, through salvation, the relationship restored, man, we begin to have a life that's so much different, so much more beautiful, so much more at peace, so much more filled with joy, not just working hard to try to figure out how to make things happen. We can surrender to God's plan and then find rest in him and in that plan. It's an awesome journey of relationship. And ultimately, as we are filled by the Spirit, as we receive grace, we're filled by the Spirit so that God can work through us and do good works that glorify him. Like what a powerful picture. And so have you received grace? Because everything I'm going to talk about from here forward today is absolutely dependent on this fact. This moment, I must receive grace. You see, everything that's going to flow out of me is a result of what's flowed into me. As I surrender and I'm filled with God's love and I'm filled with hope and patience and joy and peace, Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, as as we're filled with that, the outflow is what comes next. A natural, spirit filled outflow for the benefit of our community, our, to reach the nations, and God's name to be known here and there all over. This is a beautiful part of the truth. So first, before we move on, I just want to challenge you. If you haven't received grace, please take some time. Take some time and pray about this. This is an incredible opportunity today to realize that God has so much more for you, so much more for me, so much more for us, ultimately. So first, we must receive this grace, this good news of salvation through Jesus. What a gift he's given us. Second is, we have to learn to extend that grace to others, to see that as ultimately why we received it in the first place. We've been using the verbiage as we walk through the one anothering series. And that was not intentional, by the way, to have this message on the heels. I think God set us up to see ourselves as one body in a beautiful, loving way to extend grace grace to others, to be a part of the process, to be a conduit of that grace or a movement of it to others, not a cul-de-sac where I just receive it and then I got to stand my home and go, oh, look how good this grace is. So we're called to extend to others and I love how it says it. And I shared this at our 50 years in the park, but I just want to unpack it a little more. 
2 Timothy 2, this is Paul writing to Timothy and he's explaining to him, now that you've received this grace, you must extend it. It's gotta be an outflow of you because that's the mission of God that it wouldn't stop here. And so he says it this, like this, he says, you then my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, that same grace that you've received, be strengthened by it. And what you have heard from me, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust it to faithful men. And this word is anthropos. That means men and women. Entrust it to faithful men and women who will be able to teach it to others also. Do you see the four generations idea? Paul, generation one. Timothy, generation two. Faithful men and women, generation three. Teaching others, generation four. This idea of an extension of the grace of God, the saving grace comes through Christ, teaching them, explaining to them, and living it out, as it says, in the presence of many witnesses. That it shows up in my everyday life, that I don't walk out of a Sunday gathering and don't look like this. This is what I'm called to look like when I leave the building and when I enter the building, when I enter into my school, when I enter into my workplace, when I enter into the community where I perhaps love other people. This is the the key for us to continue to get focused on because I'm afraid one of the dangers I think I've seen historically in the church globally We've been so focused on the idea of finding Christ, which is great. Finding faith, which is awesome. Surrendering to Jesus, receiving the gift of grace, fantastic. Getting baptized, another great movement of God in our life and an acknowledgement of his grace in our life. And then seeing that as the finish line, not the starting line. So when we see salvation as the finish line, we neglect this passage. We neglect the call in our lives to take what we've received and now pass it on. So four generations, that's the the heart of this. I need everyone in the room to listen. See, this is not just for the red dot professional clergy people. This is for the body of Christ, all of it, 100%. And so whether you're a man or a woman, boy or a girl, young or old, shy or outgoing, whether you're rich or poor, there is nobody that's excluded from this. It's so important for us to see all of us as essential. Because one of the things I want to speak to is the youngest in the room, wherever that is, whoever's the youngest right now, in the room now, you are essential to the expansion of the kingdom of God for the generations to come. So what are you doing to develop grace in you with God, to experience his grace in you as he pours into you? What are you doing? Do you see yourself as essential today? Or are you saying things like, yeah, when I reach this age, when I get to that place, then I'll start to live this out. It does start now and your generation number one, all of you, your generation number one in this passage. Who's your number two? Who's the generation number two? Who's the generation number three? Who's generation number four? And obviously we have our me first. This is where it starts. Being developed, being transformed, fully surrendered in relationship with the Lord. It starts with me. But it also extends to your family. What's your family dynamic right now? What does that look like for you? There's, we're all in a different phase perhaps of that story. But what's your family dynamic? Because that can be part of your generation's. But don't exclude the outside world of your family from part of the generations. And remember, this is a work of God so that no one can boast. So are you open to this kind of a lifestyle? Do you have a vision that says, wherever I go, this is what I'm called to, to share it with others? The third thing I want to bring out today is we are called to excel in gracious giving. Excel in gracious giving. See, the act of grace that was poured out for me is meant to be poured out for others. So I'm I'm called to excel in that. And this passage, it just kind of wrecks me because when I use it as a, a, a measuring rod of my heart, 
One, I get excited about God, what God would like to do in me and through me. And two, I often go, man, how did they get this heart? What would it look like for family church to be known as excelling in gracious giving? And I just want to say, first of all, as a body, I'm continually blown away by your generosity. So don't think this is a message on you're not doing enough. What I want to ask you is, are you willing to ask God, is there more you'd like to do? Instead of a, I'm not doing enough perspective, what if it was, God, is there more you'd like to do? I'm excited about what you're doing. See, I'm excited to see that Family Church would be known for gracious giving in Douglas County. Excited for Family Church known to be gracious in their giving toward translation work like we've done in Cambodia and throughout into Southeast Asia and into Africa. What would we be known for? So Paul, I want to take you to 2 Corinthians. Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and he's lifting up the Macedonian church. I just want you to marvel with me at the Macedonian church's response. As Paul says, this is an example. This is an example. Look where we go in 2 Corinthians chapter chapter 8. Excuse me. Let's start here in verse 1. Paul writing, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches in Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflown in a wealth of generosity on their part. Let's back up. Have you ever found yourself saying, someday I'll give when I have enough? Have you ever found yourself saying that? Someday I want to be super generous as soon as I reach this marker in my life, whatever that marker might be, whether it's financial, whether it's the job marketplace, whatever that is. When I get here, then I'll do this mentality. I want you to comb through this with me and look at the heart of the church in Macedonia. Look at what God was doing through this church. First, he says this, Notice, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God. It started with God. His grace flowing through the Macedonian church into the people of that body. And look at their response. In a severe test of affliction. So in the heart of hard times, whether that was persecution, whether it was just the culture of even some of the religious leaders, whatever was happening, it was a, not just a tough time, it was severe. And in the severe test of affliction, what was their response? First, an abundance of joy. Wow. I don't know how to deal with that. What do you mean an abundance of joy? You're being severely afflicted and the outflow of that is joy? And not just a little, an abundance of joy? That's the work of the grace of God. Because they're very aware that regardless of the affliction, God has something more for me, something better. It's beautiful. So in the abundance of joy, and then let's heap it on top a little bit more, their extreme poverty. Not just they just didn't have much in their extreme poverty. So they have this abundance of joy in the midst of severe affliction and extreme poverty. And what was the result of God's grace flowing through them? An overflow in the wealth of generosity on their part. We've used the the word for worship, the definition, I'm sorry, definition we've kind of tried to, how do you define worship? The treasuring of God above all things that overflows into external acts of glorification. Do you think God is glorified in this? My goodness. In their severe affliction, in their extreme poverty, the outflow of God's grace was joy and generosity. I want to be known for that. I want family church to be known for that, to give glory to God, not so we can pat ourselves on the back because we're joining God in that mission. This really challenged me, but then it gets even more extreme. Like, as if this wasn't enough, look what it says. Verse three, for they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, 
of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. The second thing you need to hear They gave themselves to the Lord first. This, again, I want to bring it back to you, please, you and me, independently, individually, with God, receiving that grace. This was their focal point. And what was the result? In their extreme poverty, (laughs) in the severe affliction, they gave according to their means. This was not about how much they gave. It was what they had. They gave according to their means and beyond their means, I don't know how they accomplished that. I'm guessing they sold things. They, they did all kinds of things. Maybe they had fundraisers, a bake sale. I don't know what they did, but they gave beyond their means. And then verse four, begging us earnestly for the favor. When's the last time you begged to give toward the kingdom of God? When's the last time you said, man, this isn't enough opportunity Like we're in the middle now. I know we're launching like uh, Operation Christmas Child. And some of you have been begging for that. Praise God. Like, when are we going to start? I can't wait. I see this heart in many of you, but I'm also challenged to say, what could God do through Family Church if this was our heart continually begging for opportunity, looking for ways? How can we bless the movement of God in Douglas County? How can we bless the movement of God in Southeast Asia? How can we bless the movement of God in my workplace? What can we do? Begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part. That's the heart that I want to have. I don't want to look at the things that God has given me, which are all his, and just withhold. I don't want to withhold from that. In fact, there's a danger. We can become two mindsets. We can have an abundance mindset or a scarcity mindset. We can have the abundance mindset that says, look what God has given. His abundance is incredible. His grace is poured into me. He's already given me everything I could ask or imagine. And he will provide even in the things where I'm not sure there's going to be provision. I trust that his will, he will provide. Or I can have the scarcity. If I don't withhold this, I'm not sure tomorrow's going to be okay. And I know there's a balancing act of wisdom here. So don't, don't neglect that God gave us wisdom too to evaluate our finances and to say, yeah, it's important you pay your bills. Like this is part of the journey we're on. But what would it look like for family church to not have as many bills collectively so that the generosity could be an outpour? What would that look like? Verse nine, he continues, or sorry, verse six, he continues on. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as, as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. There's this word that caught me. I hadn't caught this. Twice it's stated. There's an act of grace. Well, what act of grace is he talking about? Giving. It's an act of grace. It's an outflow of God's grace in me that shows up in how I invest in others. I think this is specific to finances, but I think it plays out also into the rest of our outpouring I think it does mean that we're in a a posture of service, in a posture of surrender, in a posture of just going out and saying, how can I bless you? But he says, look what he says, but as you excel in everything, so as you're excelling in faith, as your faith is increasing, as you're excelling in speech, your ability to proclaim the gospel and share the good news, as you're excelling in knowledge, understanding and experiencing the relationship you have with God, in all earnestness, that means innately it's a desire of my heart, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Do not neglect the heart of God when it comes to your finances. Some of you know the famous quote, oh, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Very true. Where your treasure is, 
your heart is. If God's your heart, he's your treasure, what are you doing with what he's blessed you with? There's a quote from Tim Keller. I don't have it exactly, but basically he says something like this. Aren't you glad? Oh, Tim Keller, he's a, a pastor, theologian, died about a year ago. But he said, aren't you glad Jesus didn't stop at 10% of the cross? Aren't you glad he didn't say, you know, I think the crown of thorns is enough. I'll let you all take the rest. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't stop at 50%? Just the hands nailed, but I'll leave the feet. Aren't you glad that in his act of grace, he went the full 100%? I'm glad. It challenges me to evaluate all that I have and how I'm called to do more with it. What is God calling me to? I think the test, uh, Jim, Jim, this guy in South Africa, I travel with some of you know Jim, and, and uh, we were together in Korea recently, but he says it this way, and I don't know, he may have taken this from somebody. He said, the test of prosperity is greater than the test of adversity. Remember the camel, the impossibility of the camel through the eye of the needle we taught on a few weeks ago? The test of prosperity is greater than the test of adversity. The willingness to trust God with my health and my wealth. That's tough. Why, are, why is money such a restrictor? Because often the more we get, the less we want to release. It is just the nature. We like to stockpile. And God is calling us to something different. And so I wanted to close this passage with the great picture of our Savior that Paul refers to in verse 8. And I want you to hear the first part. He says, in, in retrospect of excelling in the act of grace, I say this not as a command. Pause right there. If you're hearing here we go again. This is the church wanting the money. If that's what you're hearing, you're missing the, the heart. Because the fact is, I think Paul makes it clear, this isn't a command. But I want you to look at why he says it this way. He says, I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine, that your agape love, your sacrificial love is genuine. This is one way to represent when I give up my finances, this act of grace, that it's genuine because it's earnest from my heart, not a, com not a compelling thing where I'm compelling you or somebody says you have to. It's like, that's never God's heart. He wants you to be excited and gracious and generous with joy and abundance, not okay, I guess I have to do this. That's not God's heart. And I have found in my life, as I begin to surrender, I begin to experience freedom. Because I realize, oh yeah, I thought all this stuff was mine. It's actually yours for your benefit, for your glory. I, I thought it was mine. He says, well, yeah, use it. But would you like to do more with it? Verse 9 for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Jesus poured everything out for you and me. Everything. To the point of death. He, the <laughs> king of the universe, came and poured everything out for you and me so that we could have life in him abundantly. Grace poured out over us. Hope in him eternally. This is the heart of God. And he says, look, here's the example. What does it look like to excel in gracious giving? It's to be willing to evaluate and say, God, what would you do with my life? I desire to do more. I desire that. 
So I want you to look at three things about what building for generations. I'm going to lay this out fairly quickly, and this is a process we're going to work through. Um, But I want to just challenge you and invite you into an opportunity to see Family Church beyond today, to see your role as the church beyond whatever it is today you're doing to what God may be calling you to. So there's three main things I want to draw out. First, building for generations is about locations and gatherings, places where we gather and send out. So we are going to be looking at how we can raise funds to pay off some debt from the buildings and the projects, the South Umpqua building, some of the projects at the Sutherland campus, just finalizing some of the details from the work that we've done. And then, of course, ultimately putting a campus officially finally in the Winston area uh, so we don't have to do rent anymore. A place that will become a hub for the community, a place where people can gather when they're hurt and when they need healing, where they can come to find community, where they can go in a state of emergency, where they can host weddings and funerals and be a part of the community. It's a landing place where community can gather. It's also a place for gospel training for raising up, learning how to love one another, learning how to love one another in the gospel, right? In a hostile world, this is what we're called to do, to love one another. And this is a place where one of the places we can gather. Second thing I want us to think about is how will we raise up leaders? We must continue to get the vision of raising up leaders for the next generations. Who will be the leaders of Family Church in 2030? or in the community, or in house churches, if God moves in that direction, or if we're called to plant another campus. I don't know. Let's see what God wants to do. But who's going to raise up those leaders? That's our responsibility, all of us, from the nursery volunteer who loves those kids, all the way up to the life group leader who's pouring into people to send them out. It's all essential, all of us raising up leaders and mobilizing missionaries to send out. Who will we raise up to go to the unreached, to the frontier missions where nobody's heard the gospel? This is important for us. Who will be the leaders in 2040 and 2050 when I may be long gone? Who knows? Who's going to be the leaders? Because we must continue to realize it is all of us working together, not one leader. But we must have leadership. We must be increasing and raising up leaders and mobilizing those. And the third point is, the heart of this is to saturate Douglas County and reach the nations with the gospel. Saturate Douglas County with the gospel through life groups, through taking classes like perspectives to help you get a bigger vision of God's plan for the world and how you can be part of that plan. It's about going to missionaries made and followers made and disciples made and flourish groups and discipling one another and inviting people into a life with you, inviting them into your homes. This is about saturating Douglas County, coaching, training, and increasing our impact. I have a a vision here that our mission team is looking at. Currently, we're reaching about eight unreached people groups. Like that's huge, Family Church. It's because of your generosity. But could we do 30 in the next 10 years? Could we be part of helping reach 30 unreached people groups? People who don't have a Bible, don't have a church, don't have a believer, they have nothing. That's what's at stake. Can we be a part of that vision? And so I'm going to ask you now to take a moment. There's a card in your program. And I'm going to ask you to do some evaluation. I'd love eventually to each one, even a husband, wife team, even kids, to evaluate where you're at. You students in your high school years, giving starts, joining God in the act of gracious giving starts when you're called to do that, which is, I believe, honestly, the moment we said yes to Jesus. And he said, what would you do with me? So you got this card with you. I'm going to have you look at the first side. I skipped a slide though. (laughs) Can I just celebrate with you for a moment? And now you're looking at that card. It's a bad teacher faux pas, but would would you look at the screen one more time? It excites me because I've talked about the generosity as if we're not there maybe. Maybe that's what you've heard. And I want to celebrate your generosity. 
I just want to remind you, there's a well project in Africa. And some of you have been wondering, when's it going to happen? Well, we're finally launching that in February, beginning the process, completion by April. It's going to take a little more finances. We've set aside the money that was already dedicated, and we're going to continue to move that. I want to celebrate and thank you for your generosity as we continue to care for the widows in Africa and Jean specifically, who's part of this process. We, you've been a part of bringing the gospel and the New Testament translation work. You're a part of that to the Krung. And now we're looking at the Brow and the Jirai. You've been a part of blessing South County, where you go and into your community, where we've raised kids to do VBS, to come to camps, to, to equip them and coach them, and you serving day after day and week after week in your, in your buildings and in your community where you're at. And of course, the outpouring of a campus that had to shift to the ark. And we just watched as so many of you just said, yeah, I'm in, let's go. We need to carry this forward and see how God might increase though our influence for the gospel. And so you got that card and I'm just gonna do this kind of quick. I'm sorry, I know I'm going a little long today, but would you just take a moment and evaluate the first side. There's a, a schematic that helps you look at the potential revenue that we're desiring to raise, two and a half million dollars in the next five years. And it would take, according to this chart, 342 givers at the rates that you can see there. Just evaluate that for yourself. I'm gonna ask you two things. First, I wanna target anybody in this room right now. You are brand new to faith, you're new to family church, or you're a visitor. Welcome to Family Church. I'm glad you're here. But I want to ask you to evaluate, if you've never given, where you might begin to give to the regular giving and offerings to keep the operations of Family Church going. You could use this as a chart, a way that you might measure that. Say, wow, I never thought about that. $40 or $50 a month, that's, that's a stretch for me. But maybe that's what God is calling you to. Maybe it's $2. And he's saying, would you, where will you start? I'd like you to evaluate your heart, not from what you think you should give, but what God is going to call you to. Just evaluate that and take an act of faith. Increase your faith step, your trust in God. And I encourage you to do that. And then for those of you I'm going to talk to who are part of the church regular giving, you've been here for a while or you've been investing in God's work and now you're investing here locally, I want to say thank you. We continue to need your faithful giving to increase in sharing the gospel. But I'm going to ask you to evaluate two things. One, what's your current giving and how God might be calling you to increase that in the year ahead. Things do get more expensive. We're all a part of that, I understand. But what might God be calling you to to invest in the generations, specifically in the generations? So if you turn the card over, here's what I'd love for you to consider. I'd love for you to consider praying. God, what are you calling me to? What does this look like? God, what are you saying to me? And so as you evaluate your current giving, what would you be called to invest in the years to come as we build for generations? And so what we're going to ask is you take these cards and you pray over this. You talk as a family, you, you spend time with God and you evaluate. And what we're going to ask right now is that you return the portion of card that's perforated, the Half of it's for you, and you return this card. You can put it in the giving envelopes. You can drop it off uh, to your campus pastors or some leader at your campus that you begin to pray and return those, and we see what God might do in the years to come. This card is a way for us to know what your heart's desire is as you've pursued God. I want this to be an earnest process, not one of guilt, not one of shame, one of just sincerity to say, God, I desire to partner with you. What would you do? You can go online. There's a website that we're building so you can get more information about this. I'll walk through this in more detail at that website if you're wondering what this looks like. But for today, could you just consider praying and see what God might be calling you to and return the card? We'll talk more about when to begin the actual giving. Of course, you could start now. That's fine but we'll give you more clarity on that as we walk through this. The vision is this, to pay off our debts, to plant a campus in the ark, and to continue to increase our generosity and our influence for the gospel 
throughout Douglas County and into the nations. And I was just challenged by Amy Carmichael, a missionary in India, 55 years, who said it this way, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. You can give without agape, but you cannot agape without giving. It is the outflow of love and grace given to you. Love you guys. Sorry I was a little long today. I'm going to release to the campus pastors. Hey, thank you for sticking around with me. And I know that some of you couldn't attend a campus this weekend, or some of you are in California. I got a great email this week just hearing about how God is moving in your heart. And so I just want to challenge you to this. Just pray. Would you consider praying? There's, there's resources available through the website. You can look there to find out more about how you could partner with us. Because even the fact that you're watching from home, is, this is a resource that helps extend the gospel. And there are those that work behind the scenes to make this possible for you. So just want to ask you to pray. You know, I just desire that this would be, as the, the text said today, an earnest outcome, an earnest overflow of God's grace that's being poured into you. So I'm going to pray with you today and just say thank you for joining me. And I hope that this is not only encouraging, but also perhaps thought-provoking. What is it that, God, you're calling me to, to see my neighbors and, my, and the nations reach? So let's pray. Yeah, Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the challenge uh, and for your generosity that you poured over us so freely, God. We thank you. We give you praise and we look forward to what you would like to do through each one of us and then corporately as the church. God, we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen.